Anyone who's seen the rest of my channel can tell that Splatoon music is kind of my thing. I couldn't tell you a thing about the competitive meta or the comics, and there's plenty of lore from the Sunken Scrolls that I tend to forget about. But some Splatoon fans might not even know that there is even more lore to the franchise than what directly features in the games. I'm talking about the gratuitous amount of information there is about the music of Splatoon. I have never seen another game do what Splatoon does with their soundtracks. To the uninitiated, every track in the games has a fictional artist attributed to it. Overworld music, battle tracks, shop themes, even the elevator music that plays on the waiting screens were all created by Splatoon characters with names, individual personalities, and interconnected backstories. While there's some interesting entries in this iceberg that are featured in the games themselves, most of this information is found in official social media posts, art books, magazines, and album booklets. The fan wiki Inkopedia was very useful for getting a lot of information, but I want to make it clear that I'm not just taking the wiki at face value. Stuff can be lost in translation, and I mean anyone can edit these, so I did my best to find the original sources to fact check the entries. Huge special thank you to Splash Road, a native Japanese speaker who reached out to me to give me direct help with tons of translations. Alright, let's dive into this iceberg and see what we find. English lyrics are an illusion. First, before we discuss anything else about the world of Splatoon music, we have to establish that contrary to the 40 plus lyric videos I've made, the vocals in Splatoon are not in English. And they're not in Japanese either. And going against all conventional rules of how to pace an iceberg video, this is going to be the longest section of the entire thing. Because for the past three years, I have been bombarded non-stop with comments telling me that Splatoon music is Japanese! Along with a nice healthy side of condescension for my audacity to make English lyrics for what is clearly a Japanese song. I even made a short video about this years ago but I don't think I went into enough detail, so this is my second attempt. HA! I've tricked you all into watching an entirely different video within a video for the next eight minutes about linguistics and sensory phenomena! Strap in! Alright, so if the music sounds like Japanese and it's written in Japanese, how is it not Japanese? Well, you'd only think it looks and sounds that way if you don't actually know the language. These lyrics are not written in Japanese. They are written in hiragana and katakana, Japan's two syllabaries. A syllabary is a writing system wherein individual glyphs don't represent a single letter, like an alphabet, but instead a full syllable. Japan has two syllabaries because katakana is specifically used to transcribe foreign words. This will actually come up a couple times later in the iceberg, so put a pin in that. So yes, you can read these lyrics, but you're just reading pronunciation. These words don't mean anything. It's what's known as gibberish. I mean, just try to translate it. Just you try! Back when I used to foolishly engage with mind-numbingly ignorant comments like these, someone literally doubled down by saying they knew they were right because they were advanced in Japanese. Oh, it'd be funny if it wasn't so sad. Let me lay down some very basic Japanese grammar for you. If these lyrics were really Japanese, you would find case marker particles or common verb conjugations. Or you know, the word so common it became a literal weeaboo meme, which just means is. Beyond having no signs of Japanese grammar, the lyrics don't even follow Japanese phonotactics, which are the constraints a language has on what kind of phoneme sequences it can have. As an example, squid is a real English word, but this couldn't be, as it betrays the phonotactic rules against certain consonant clusters in English. SD can't be an onset, and QU can't be a coda. Every language has different phonotactic rules, and the rules for Japanese are broken very noticeably in off the hook music. Tear you guys, bran bran, yurabira, come on, all but one of these words literally couldn't be Japanese. Now, even with all of that, I have had people link me this video saying, but look, you can see them singing. Yes, 
those are the vocalists for Pearl and Marina. And yes, they are singing. And here's Katy Perry singing a gibberish version of Last Friday Night for The Sims 3. Yarby Denzel Table Doops, Evie Duke Mimi Shoops, Hippie Keeps the Upper Coop. Even in every Octoprism song, the vocals you're hearing are actually gibberish. I mean, I write the lyrics in English, but for the actual recording, I make phonetically similar lyrics that sound a little bit more Japanese-esque to recreate the illusion of Splatoon music. So what is this illusion? The fact that you can hear real words in the gibberish. This illusion is called auditory pareidolia. Pareidolia is the phenomenon where we can see specific images in random or ambiguous patterns and shapes. Like thinking there's a face on the moon when it's just shadows on a rock. Or seeing Jesus and a piece of toast and trying to sell it on eBay for $25,000. Faces tend to be the most common form of this illusion because as social animals, we are hardwired to seek other faces. Our brains are constantly trying to make sense of the world around us, so sometimes we'll perceive meaning where there isn't any, or interpret something differently than how it was intended. I see a very peculiar hand. I see a giraffe. An auditory version of this illusion is hearing real words in nonsense, or in a language you don't understand. The former can be heard in those 240p conspiracy videos where people play a song backwards to find ooh, a spooky hidden message. And as for the latter, you get a veteran's discount if you remember these. <laughs> Basically, our brains just misinterpret meaning all the time and make shit up. A famous example of people taking auditory pareidolia to an extreme is the actual, literal conspiracy theory that a frankly unnerving amount of people believe that Paul McCartney of the Beatles died and was replaced by a lookalike. One of their pieces of proof is a secret message they hear when they play the song Revolution 9 backwards. Another scrap of evidence heard in the music isn't even reversed. They just heard it wrong. Believers of this conspiracy listened to this very quiet line at the end of Strawberry Fields Forever and heard... But uh, what John Lennon is actually saying is... Chances are you just heard both of those phrases just by having them on screen. Auditory pareidolia is a matter of persuading your brain to hear something by giving you a visual guide. Before I move on to the rest of the iceberg, last thing to say is why Splatoon music is not in a real language. First of all, this isn't confirmed, but I wouldn't rule it out. Easy localization. A song doesn't need to be translated for other countries if it's not in a real language to begin with. Second, for the canon lore. Splatoon takes place 10 to 12,000 years in the future in what they call the Mollusk Era. Mammals are extinct and sea creatures have evolved. Do you really think that they would still be speaking human language? No, they would have naturally developed their own. And third, from the mouth of the music developers themselves, Toru Minigishi, Mr. Isamu Tsuji, Shiho Fuji, and Tetsuya Oyama, the music itself is mostly pop music with digital synths, and the lyrics are in squid language, so when I listen to it all the time, I feel like I'm listening to Western music. That's for sure, I don't understand the lyrics. Yes, that's right. I can concentrate on the quality of the music. Because I don't understand the lyrics, the vocals sound like part of the instruments, and I really like the feeling of listening to Western music. It seems that some foreigners think that the lyrics are Japanese. Certainly, some songs have a fairly Japanese-like pronunciation, so some people may think so. They were literally trying to make it sound more like Western pop music, so honestly, me making English lyric videos for fun is honoring the game dev's intentions. Okay, that's all I have to say about that. Let's move on to the rest of the iceberg. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Canon Bomb Rush Blush Lyrics So just because the vocals themselves are gibberish doesn't mean that they don't have a meaning. 
It's only gibberish to us because we don't know the Inkling language. But the developers have given us a few canon lyric translations, including Bomb Rush Blush. This one is so high on the iceberg because it is seen directly in the game. During the DJ Octavia boss fight in Splatoon 2, with Callie hypnotized atop his Octobot King 2, she sings a frantic rendition of Bomb Rush Blush that eventually turns into the duet Tidal Rush when Marie joins in. While you're bombarded with splat bombs, dialogue boxes for Callie pop up with lyrics. In the North American localization, the first time you take on this fight, she'll say... And on subsequent playthroughs, when Callie just can't pass up the fashionable allure of those funky shades, she says... The exact meaning of the lyrics will depend on the localization, but the bomb motif remains consistent. The Japanese version of her lyrics read which, interestingly enough, only rhymes in English. One thing that I want to point out, though, is that her dialogue is only in katakana, but goes back to a katakana hiragana mix when she loses the hypno shades. Keep that in mind, it'll come up later. A, B, X, Y. So we know by now that language is complicated, and localizations can change a lot of things. The band we English speakers know as Chirpy Chips is A, B, X, Y in Japan. This is a reference to the ABXY buttons on the Wii U gamepad, Splatoon 1's sole console. This appears to be inspired by their chiptune aesthetic, even using old handheld consoles for an authentic and nostalgic sound. This is a real technique people use, by using hardware that data mines the 8-bit waveforms inside the consoles. ABXY also appears to be a reference to the Japanese chiptune band YMCK. There's plenty of trivia about other band names, but I felt this one was worth mentioning because it seems to be common knowledge amongst the fanbase, possibly due to the fact that their logo looks vaguely like ABXY, like a lot of scripts found in the game that intentionally look similar to real words. Kind of using that pareidolia illusion, don't you think? Pearl's voice is dangerous. Anyone familiar with the DLC Octo expansion knows Pearl deals the finishing blow to the final boss, Commander Tartar, by powering the Princess Cannon with her voice. But she doesn't actually need any fancy tech to create devastating effects. She's been known as the Club Destroyer, her voice producing 2,000 times the standard frequency. Even as a child, she damaged the venue of the youth folk singing contest when she created a shockwave. Even Turf War stages in the game have been changed because of her. The Splatoon 2 trailer from January 2017 starts with a shot of the reef, and we can see that the bridge in the middle is made of wood. It had since been replaced with stone. The canon reason for this is that Pearl broke it with her voice. Fuck dudes be fucking sleeping. Before joining off the hook, Pearl dabbled in death metal, as shown in this song from the Octo Expansion chat logs. At the end of the song, you can hear something being destroyed with loud mic feedback, along with the irritated grumbling of what I can assume is the club owner. No doubt this is one of the occasions that got her the nickname Club Destroyer. Deep Cut, the new three-member idol group. Which, by the way, you may call it! I had to find somewhere to slot them into my pre-existing script, didn't I? All the way on the surface of the iceberg, as they were literally just announced August 10th, 2022. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on them, since I am intentionally leaving out a lot of Splatoon 3 info because it's just so new. There is eight years worth of information on the first two games. I want to give Splatoon 3 a few years before I make a second deep dive, but let's go over what we've seen from the Direct. The trio fades in, accompanied by a Shinoboy flute, drum, and, hilariously, an air horn. <laughs> hiding their faces with Kyogen masks. Splash Road pointed out that these two could be based on the fox and tanuki mask, but with a shark and eel twist, respectively. And I think Big Man's might be a Hanya yokai By the way, all three of these are seen in the promo art for the story mode. They unveil themselves and proclaim that Splat's Bill is their turf, striking a pose and holding out three fingers on each hand, further enforcing the three motif of the game. First, we've got an Octoling, Shiver, the Shark Tamer. She sports a very traditional Japanese look, with a twisted Hachimaki headband, sarashi bandages, shoes reminiscent of Geta sandals with two-toed Tobi socks, 
and an Uchiwa fan with a blue symbol on it. The designs within this bottom line remind me of the muscle fibers on fish, though it could also be wood? She has deep blue hair, a bright red blush on her fingers, thin eyes styled like a Maiko, with a blood red iris and classic octoling pupils. Next, we have an inkling, Fry, the Eel Master, specifically Moray Eels according to the Japanese translation and her Japanese name. And I'll be honest, I had trouble figuring out what was going on with her design until I realized I was looking in the wrong place. Rather than sticking to an Eastern style, she's actually Indian and South Asian inspired. She wears a yellow crop top showing off her belly as is fashionable in modern India, harem pants with holes in them, possibly a reference to the split leg design or possibly a reference to intentionally Swiss cheesing clothing for high fashion, and the little fascinator on her head could be referencing mango chutney or salsa, mangoes being the national fruit of India. Fry has bright yellow hair styled similar to a fishtail plait, which fades to purple just like her fingertips. Her ears are long and curve slightly upwards, she has a prominent pointy overbite, and yellow plus sign irises just like we've seen in the Squid Sisters and Pearl. And something fun is that she might be based on the vampire squid, which, by the way, are found in the Indian Ocean. In classic Splatoon Idol fashion, both cephalings have elements to their designs that tie them together. They both have pendants in the shape of an octopus and squid. They have similar dupatta shawls and three earrings on their right ears only that appear to be made out of teeth. Shivers are clearly from a shark, so that must mean Fry's earrings are made out of moray eel teeth. And lastly, they wear their eyebrows as little triangles. Now before I move on to their third member, I have to uh, address the forehead in the room. <laughs> I imagine discourse akin to Pearl's debut will come back to haunt us again, but I'd like to let you guys in on something that will make these designs make a little more sense. As for Pearl's large forehead and dot eyebrows, this was a reference to her princess theme. Not only is she known as MC Princess, but her Japanese name Hime just straight up means princess. Her eyebrows and large forehead were a reference to hikimayu, literally meaning pulling eyebrows, which was a practice done between the years 794 and 1185 in the Heian period, where aristocratic women would remove their eyebrows and paint smudges on their foreheads instead, and this style was first adopted by the Japanese imperial court, being a look of status and prestige. Deep Cut is even shown dancing on Mikoshi, a type of sacred Shinto palanquin, and palanquins have historically been used to transport the elite all throughout Asia. But Fry isn't East Asian coded, she's South Asian coded. Well, in some parts of India, large foreheads are traditionally seen as more attractive, thought to be indicative of intelligence and wisdom. Oh yeah, this is big brain time. Now, ever since I started writing the script, there has been a ton of discourse about this, so here's a disclaimer. The two South Asian informants that I had for this video are from Pakistan and Southern India, and both are familiar with this forehead myth, but South Asian people are not a monolith. This is an old concept that many modern South Asians may not even know about, but it does have an undeniable cultural significance in parts of South Asia, whether or not you know about it personally. And I mean, what else could be the reason for Fry's immaculate dome? I can't wait to see what Nintendo says. And finally, we have our third member, Big Man, the Dancing Manta. Look at this absolute unit. He is a manta ray, I believe the giant oceanic variety, considering his markings, and that he is indeed a big man. I tried to find out what the thing on his head could be, but even Splash Road is unsure, though mentions that it has kabuki-like markings. Something peculiar about Big Man is that he seems to only speak in A's, with parentheticals showing what the meaning is. I think this is supposed to be like a Pokemon kind of thing, since in Japanese, A means stingray. Before I move on to the rest of the iceberg and away from Splatoon 3, I have to say that I love how they're pulling influences from more than just the East and West. Even the way the girls dance, this fancy footwork is reminiscent of Odissi, one of the eight classical dance forms of India. And listening to their debut song, Anarchy Rainbow, you can hear elements of Brazilian samba, instruments alike to the sarad and tambura, and many gamakas in the vocals, which is a special way of connecting notes in Carnatic music by sliding and oscillating the tone. Splatoon 3 looks like it's going to be all about broadening horizons. 
No doubt much more information will be revealed in the coming weeks that hasn't been stated here, but I think that's enough on Deep Cut for now. Marina was saved by the Calamari Incantation. Before Marina met Pearl on Mount Nantai and became a pop sensation, she was an octoling soldier under the oppressive Octarian regime. A childhood prodigy, she completed elementary training at nine years old and skipped multiple grades. She helped design the flutters and upgraded many octa weapons, eventually rising in the ranks all the way to part of DJ Octavio's Wasabi Supply Unit, his entourage. And so during DJ Octavio's final boss fight in Splatoon 1, when the Squid Sisters blast the heavenly melody through the stadium to invigorate Agent 3, Marina was there. And after the music reached her ears, Marina was cured of her lifetime of Octarian brainwashing. All she said was, this changes everything. There are no details on how exactly this works. Even Cap'n Cofish says, the song has powers that no one can explain. Calamari Incantation is a cover song. You heard that right, arguably the number one most iconic song from the franchise, Calamari Incantation, is a cover of a folk song, the chorus of Calamari County. The famous heavenly melody itself was not originally written by the Squid Sisters. It is, however, what propelled them into stardom when they performed it for the annual youth folk singing contest. Side note, the American localization says it's Inkopolis's first annual contest, but the non-American English localization and original Japanese don't mention it being the first or being in Inkopolis. But considering Pearl also grew up in Calamari County and also attended a youth folk singing contest as a child, it can be assumed her and the Squid Sisters attended the same one, though probably not the same year. You can hear the chorus of Calamari County in this video, though it's debated on whether or not this is specifically a recording of their performance or just a folk rendition. Now, for some reason, the page on Inkipedia for the chorus says that the Squid Sisters wrote it for the contest, but this is blatantly wrong. It's a song carved into the very DNA of all Inklings and began as a way to celebrate and show respect for the bounty of the sea. And digging a little deeper, the Splatoon 1 album booklet says it's been passed down since ancient times. You know, the way folk songs are. Omega 3 In Splatoon 2, a new game mode was introduced, Salmon Run. You work for the mysterious and shady Mr. Grizz to collect golden eggs from the Salmonids. The music in this game mode was composed by a group of Salmonids themselves, Omega-3. It's interesting to see how different Salmonid culture must be. Just from looking at their album cover, we've got some interesting finds. I guess they must be hungry because they've got roast fish hanging in the back, a microwave, frying pan and utensils. The percussionist even plays his timpani with skewered corn. I wonder if he's got that eye protection from accidentally stabbing himself. Maybe the corn just really helps their distinctive sound. Or maybe he wields them for a more nefarious reason, since we've seen salmonids use frying pans as weapons. To emphasize the idiosyncratic culture, Omega-3's tracks are very unique. They feature an irregular time signature, 7-8, sometimes heard in metal bands. But even music aficionado sampling kid had a hard time deciphering other genre influences. He said he hears techno with a possible element of crust punk, otherwise known as stenchcore, a punk subgenre in England. They often have dark, pessimistic lyrics about political and societal problems. And I don't know about you, but considering the possible oppression of salmonids and the dark themes carried in the very existence of Salmon Run, Omega-3's music may have a similar motif. Before I move on, I want to point out that this band name is a reference to Omega-3 fish oil, and I'm assuming the Greek letter Omega is in lowercase to look like a 3 that fell over. Squid Squad Splits Up Squid Squad was the flagship band for Splatoon 1, writing most of the battle music for the game and debuting in the test fire promo with the demo of Splatack, but they disappeared in Splatoon 2. This is because the bassist and screamo vocalist Ikan didn't like how little tension there was during the songwriting process in Squid Squad, prompting him to leave. Oh, I can't work with all this non-tension between us. What? 
However, he does say that he was surrounded by yes-men, which I can understand. If the people around you just agree with every decision you make, you start to wonder, is this actually good, or are they just saying it's good? Ikan was the backbone of the band, so this dissolved the entire group. Interestingly, sound director Toru Minigishi actually foreshadowed this all the way back in 2015 in an interview for Famitsu Magazine, saying Squid Squad was, quote, currently popular in the world of squids, but perhaps that the trends will shift and a different band will appear. This came true when Ikan met an octoling named Warabi and formed Dispair, debuting in the Splatoon 2 for Wano Patch in August 2021, six years later. And even though the rest of the disbanded Squid Squad members never reappeared in the sequel, they're coming back for Splatoon 3. Having rebranded as Front Row, they've got a new member that appears to be some kind of mollusk. Since I'm making this before Splatoon 3's launch, we have no idea what their name is or what kind of role they will play. Are they going to be a replacement bassist? Will they do any vocals? How will this change the sound of the band in the long run? I guess we'll find out in September. Sad Clownfish The main vocalist of Turkey Chips, Potico, is a sea anemone, like the headgear merchant Annie from Splatoon 1. While obviously different variations of anemone, they both have a little clownfish living in their hair, based on the real-life symbiosis. But you'll notice this guy looks a little, uh, different from Mo. Fun fact, it's a yellow-tail clownfish instead of the classic percula variant. But, uh, that tail ain't yellow. This is because it is literally, and I quote, dying from neglect. Now that's the real dead fish. Not only is this just so dark, but it honestly opens up so many questions about the existence of unevolved sea life and their cohabitation with the more sapient creatures. How do the anemones get the fish? Are they like pets or roommates? Mo can talk, though honestly I wish he couldn't. So while unevolved physically, they're still intelligent. Why doesn't Potico's clownfish just leave? Or take care of itself, even? I doubt we'll ever get answers, but I'm rooting for you, buddy. By the way, Potico was actually revealed to be in Splatoon 3 with their English name being Harmony, but I had already recorded the section before August 10th, so let's move on. Non-binary characters. In the first trailer for Splatoon 3, the character creator seems to have removed gendered options, which brought the idea of non-binary characters to everyone's attention. But this is not the first time genderless or gender non-conforming characters have existed in Splatoon. This is not explicitly stated, but is actually revealed through the absence of gendered language used to describe a multitude of different Splatoon artists, such as multiple members of Bottom Feeders and Chirpy Chips. I can't give a definitive list due to the vagueness of the information and how varied sources are for the characters. One description may not have gendered language, then another anecdote about the same character might. Either way, headcanon whatever you want. By the way, in the wake of much discussion about Shiver's gender, Nintendo Senior Director of English Localization confirmed that Shiver identifies as female. Still, headcanon whatever you want. Turquoise October and Callie. In Splatoon 2, Callie is missing. We have no idea why or what for. All we know is that she's found brainwashed with a new fit performing with DJ Octavio and trying to blow you up. Did she always have that tattoo? It makes you wonder what happened to her during all that time. All I know is that it can't be anything good. What we do know, though, is she must have been Turquoise October's muse. This mysterious Octarian band plays through the game's story modes, and in Splatoon 2, you hear Callie's voice sampled in reverse in multiple tracks. This gives the songs an eerie feeling, like it's recognizable as Callie, but something is off, evoking that same uncanniness as seeing her on the Hypnoshades, the bubbly, energetic idol we all love brainwashed by the enemy. Or maybe that's a stretch, but I mean, there's a song called The Girl from Inkopolis, which samples Callie's vocals from Ink Me Up. The rest are Buoyant Boogie, which samples Now or Never, Octo 8 Step, which samples City of Color, or Maritime Memory, it's hard to tell. And most audible out of them all, Shooting Starfish samples Calamari Incantation. <laughs> Password Screen Easter Egg This is a quick one. 
On the password entry screen for Private Battles in Splatoon 1, each number plays a different note. If you move your cursor in this numeric pattern, you'll play Calamari Incantation. Bonus Tracks There's a couple of bonus tracks hidden at the end of Splatoon albums. This is a common type of Easter egg found in CDs and vinyl albums. They're unlisted in the booklets, but if you let the final song play out, you'll hear them. Nani? At the end of Splatoon Live and Makuhari, we fade in at the ending of the Squid Sisters' performance, thanking and bidding farewell to the crowd. When the show ends, they swim off backstage and high-five. <laughs> Sighing and clicking can be heard next, possibly removing their mics or other sound equipment. They talk for a while until Captain Cuttlefish comes and the cousins gleefully follow their grandfather out. <laughs> And at the end of Octotune Disc 1, you can hear Marina and Pearl working on their song, Fly Octo Fly. But while recording Pearl's rap, she messes up the lyrics and, well... They chat for a bit, someone swims around in ink, and they seem to play a message from Captain Cuttlefish. We have no way of knowing exactly what anyone is talking about, but it's fun to speculate. Octatronica. Has a warlord ever invented a new genre of music? Well, DJ Octavio did. Octatronica. Nothing much is said about it other than that it's distinctive and truly genius, but I have to assume that this may be the main genre of Turquoise October. This is because it's implied that DJ Octavio is their producer, even though the true identity of the band members is admittedly unknown. But come on, there's a song called I Am Octavio that the man himself plays during his boss fight. And I mean, considering the Octarians are basically goose-stepping on their first album cover and all wearing hypno-shades on their second, I can see the authoritarian ruler of a military state forcing the band he produces to make his own style of music. Fun fact, it appears Marina was influenced by Octatronica, which makes sense if it was the music she heard all the time as part of DJ Octavio's entourage. Ebb and Flow is the first song Marina made when she defected from the Octarians, and you can find the demo in the Octo Expansion chat logs. In the final version of the song, you can hear synth basses and thumping rhythms reminiscent of Turquoise October's signature style. And you know that five note jingle that plays when you save the zapfish? That's a leitmotif called Onward, made by Turquoise October. It is used in a ton of their music. And guess what's at the end of the Ebb and Flow demo? The Lydian Scale. You can't talk about Splatoon music without mentioning one of its most iconic themes, now or never. Also known as One Minute Left, it's the song that plays in every multiplayer battle when you have, you guessed it, one minute left. It's energetic, catchy, and kicks your ass into gear every time you hear it. Once that first note hits you, you know there's no going back. You have to make those 60 seconds count. Big shout out to Scruffy and his video behind Splatoon's final minute of music for pointing out something very interesting. The opening and ending melody in Now or Never
is a seven-tone progression called the Lydian scale, or Lydian mode. It's in the major scale, with the fourth note raised by a half step, which in Scruffy's words, adds an extra feeling of ascension. Variations of the scale have been used as far back as ancient Greece, and was so famously popular even Beethoven used it. Over the generations, it's been tweaked and tuned into the modern Lydian mode we hear today. And just like how this scale was modified over time, every version of Now or Never plays a little bit with these notes. Speaking of, there are a lot of versions of this song. It was first written by Squid Squad, then covered by the Squid Sisters for Splatfests. When Squid Squad disbanded and Wet Floor emerged as the main band for Turf War tunes, they decided that there was no replacing that official Turf War anthem. The commentator Gasoto Suzuki has said that it's not just a song, but a vital deciding factor of all Turf Wars. He's quoted as saying, How did I ever battle without it? I can't even remember. It's too iconic. It'd be like trying to remake the Mona Lisa. Since then, Off the Hook has given their spin on it not once but twice with a special Final Fest version. There are multiple live performances. It appears in SSBU and Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, and now we've got a new Splatoon 3 rendition. I'm assuming this one was covered by New Kids in Town Seaside, since they were the first new characters to be introduced, and I'm assuming they're the next dominant band, walking in the footsteps of Squid Squad and Wet Floor. <music> DJ Octavio's turntables are filthy. Have you ever wondered why DJ Octavio scratches his turntables with these things instead of just using one of his many limbs? What he's actually doing is making wasabi. The famously spicy green paste is made by grinding these big Japanese horseradish stems in a circular motion on a finely textured orishigane grater. Now let me repeat, DJ Octavio is making wasabi on his turntables. It may look clean in these cutscenes, but I mean, by the time Agent 3 finally splats him, Octavio was only able to get through his opening set. By the end of a full concert, I swear his entire DJ booth would be coated in layers of gritty, sticky, spicy paste, so pungent only an Octarian stuck in octoform with no nose could stand. I wonder if his wasabi unit has to clean it up. Oh, fun fact from the Kuroika manga, DJ Octavio has once been thwarted by his wasabi being replaced with regular radishes. Marina Scats Scatting is a type of singing originating in jazz where the vocalist improvises nonsensical vocables. Revealed in the lyrics to Ebb and Flow, all of Marina's vocals between the first verse and chorus is scat. So even in their own language, it's still in gibberish. That doesn't stop me from adding lyrics anyway. Deadfish sanitize herself for her art. Deadfish is the DJ of the deep, the sole creator for all music heard in the deep sea metro. With her green skin and blue hair, you can see that she has been sanitized. A euphemism for the eugenical process that brainwashes Octarians in the underground. But unlike many Octarians, Deadfish chose to undergo this process willingly, to give up her doubts and conflicts about production, and devote herself entirely to her music. Now that's dedication to a fault. Shai Ho Shai so, winning the youth folk singing competition is what propelled the Squid Sisters to stardom, but how exactly? Because one of the judges, a character named Shai Ho Shai, noticed their talent and took it upon herself to become the cousin's producer and move them all to Inkopolis. There is very little information on this character, just that she is a woman and became their producer. Now, something that I did not know when I made a lyric video for it years ago is that the demo for City of Color was not sung by the Squid Sisters. Track 38 of the Splatoon Live in Makihari Shioka Live album is called City of Color Shai Ho Shai Demo. And that title is literal. It's actually sung by Shai Ho Shai herself, since she's the one who wrote it, and recorded it as practice material to hand off to the Squid Sisters. That's probably why you could hear strange voice breaks in the demo. She's a producer, not not a singer. Parental Advisory With the prevalence of streaming music nowadays and the decline of physical albums, I wonder how many people watching recognize this, the Parental Advisory label, basically the explicit E label but from 1985. 
It was stamped onto any album with strong language or depictions of violence, sex, substance abuse, discriminatory language, or behavior. And it seems that there may be a Mollusk Era Parental Advisory label on the covers of several different Splatoon albums. DJ Lee Fish, DJ Real Soul, Turquoise October, and even the Squid Sisters. What kind of explicit content could possibly be in there? Missing Songs That's right, even Splatoon has lost media. Aside from the remix of Splatack, all of Deadfish's tracks are numbered. However, we're missing 3, 7, 10, 15, 17, and 18. I have no idea what kind of numerical significance this might have, but I'd love to hear any theories down in the comments. One piece of trivia we do know is that if you add up all the numbers from the existing titles, then divide them by the total number of songs, you get the number 8, referencing the entire Octo motif of the DLC. Was this intentional on the part of the developers? Well, game designers are a bunch of nerds, so I'd believe it. Voices of Dead Humans You might notice that the vocals in Sashimori's song sound a little bit different than other Splatoon bands. While still being unintelligible, the voices tend to sound more clear in tone and don't have as many warbly underwater effects. However, none of its members are vocalists. Instead, this funky little guy, a 10-year-old Octoling prodigy named Paul, samples voice clips from DJ Real Soul, DJ Octavio, and ancient sources, such as the fascinating prehistoric artifact, Vinyl. I mean, vinyl does already feel ancient to me because I grew up in the late 90s, but they really mean ancient. Again, this is so far in the future there are literal fossilized we use. So basically, most of the voices you hear in Sashimori are the chopped up recordings of humans long dead. Non-Octarian Octopus before Octolings became playable characters, or even more than just brainwashed enemies, there was an octopus character in Splatoon 1. The shy bassist of Chirpy Chips, Ryan, sporting that same vacant stare as Paracus dying fish for some reason. Despite lacking any resemblance to Octolings, he is a Flapjack Octopus, otherwise known as a Dumbo Octopus. Makes me think, are there any squid people that aren't Inklings? Deep Sea Liberation. I struggle to name this one, but basically this entry is how the timeline of Splatoon music reveals something interesting in the lore. Let me explain. So Marina may or may not have been the first defector from the Octarians, but I can confidently say she must have been the first to be a celebrity in Inkling society. And it seems that she may have been an inspiration for not just Octarians, but other Deep Sea life as well, to come to the surface. Sashimori and Dispair, the only bands to appear on the surface with Octolings, other than the inexplicable Flapjack Ryan, debuted in the 410 patch of Splatoon 2, October 2018, after the Octo expansion released June of 2018. Also, we can see the Sashimori bassist Carla amongst the concept art for other Deep Sea Metro characters, so we can assume she's also from the underground. This official timeline says that there are rumors floating around that Marina, Paul, and Deadfish all know each other, and maybe even performed together in the past. Marina and Deadfish are both DJs, the same logo is seen on both Paul and Deadfish's hats, and furthermore, in the Japanese version of the Family vs. Friends announcement, Marina directly states that she will be attending a three-day DJ event with Paul and Warabi. I believe that seeing Marina liberate herself and find a passion for music other than Octatronica is what inspired more and more deep sea creatures to come to the surface as well and follow their dreams. Bottom Feeder's Beef with Ink Theory Two new bands debuted in Splatoon 2 November 2017 for the version 200 patch, Bottom Feeder's and Ink Theory. The former is a five-member Celtic rock band, the latter an all-female six-member jazz band. And apparently, they don't get along. Why? We're not exactly sure. Some believe that it's because they debuted at the same time with clashing genres, causing a feeling of competition. But when I ran the Japanese text by Splash Road, she read it as, Bottom Feeders and Ink Theory, which debuted at the same time, often get together at shows, but they don't get along very well. 
But however this conflict started between them, honestly, I bet you anything, Finn bottom shot first. In the same paragraph, it describes how they're so stubborn they've clashed with their fellow bandmates so often they've nearly broken up several times. I mean, beta fish are known for their volatile nature after all. Singing Seaweed You've probably seen by now that most of the Splatoon bands have some bizarre looking sea creatures, but none more baffling than Tangle Bottom, the vocalist from Bottom Feeders. He is composed of Mozuku Seaweed, and I guess he never paid attention in school or something because he had no idea where his voice was even coming from for most of his life. Turns out, it's the sound created by the friction of the string-like organs his seaweed body is made of. His favorite revelation is that he can sing with his feet. Ink Theory's Inspiration This prolific jazz band wears their inspiration on their sleeve. Or should I say, on their sleeveless shirts. They were heavily inspired by the Splatoon 1 band High Tide Era, so much so that the lead pianist Karen, no, don't even make the joke, her name is based on the word Karen, which means pretty, attributes High Tide Era as the reason they formed Ink Theory to begin with. These three funky guys haven't reappeared since the first game, but their style lives on in Ink Theory's ska jazz fusion and that prominent frantic piano. They even wear black shirts with gold ties as an homage to High Tide Era's iconic black and red outfits. This honestly must be the ultimate compliment for Taka, High Tide Era's vocalist, who is secretly very superficial, making music for the fame rather than artistic fulfillment. Pearl's Favorite Lyric in 2018, we were blessed with an amusing 20-question Q&A with Pearl as she leads the interviewer to her absolutely baffling mansion. We learn a few interesting little tidbits, like how Pearl's favorite foods are strawberry milkshakes and cheeseburgers with no pickles, but relevant to this iceberg is question 16, asking what her favorite lyrics are. Apparently, it's this line from Nasty Majesty. <laughs> Morbid Drums. This one's short. There's a teeny tiny itsy bitsy little detail about the chorus of Calamari County that has me shook. It is traditionally played with shark skin taiko drums. I wonder how Fuka from Bottom Feeders feels about that. Maritime Memory. Yes, this end credit song is getting its very own entry all the way at the bottom of the iceberg. It initially stands out as a reprise of City of Color, the Splatoon 1 Splatfest theme. It doesn't follow the exact same lyrics, but does use the same melody, albeit at a slower tempo. Music commentator Masumi Watanuki says it's only sung at age 17, between girlhood and womanhood, which means we will never hear the Squid Sisters perform Maritime Memory again! I'm just kidding. The original Japanese text can be interpreted in a few different ways. Splash Road translated it to, The song is beautiful in its fragility, which can only be sung now, at the age of 17, between a girl and a woman and interprets it as so. It can be perceived to mean that it is beautiful because it is sung by a 17-year-old voice. I think it means that as their age changes, so does their voice, and there is a different kind of beauty. The song also features a special third voice that most people actually seem to already know about, but I am sticking to my guns about this being at the bottom of the iceberg because of the absolute roller coaster that it sent me on. At first, this video script read that I was debunking the common myth that Cap'n Cuttlefish is rapping in maritime memory. I mean, it makes sense to glean that meaning. Cap'n is the only old man we've seen rap in the games. But all the original source says is that a mysterious old man stumbled into the studio. But after hearing his voice in the disrupted recording, they decided to keep it in. Which, side note, means we have canonical lyrics to the maritime memory rap. He says, I may wear rags, but my heart is like fine silk, and my lustrous voice has not faded. So again, the original Japanese is kind of up to interpretation, and it can be translated a few different ways. Because this was actually a Japanese idiom, which are notoriously hard to localize. It directly reads as, I may wear rags, but my heart is brocade. 
which is a kind of beautifully decorated silk fabric. But the original source still never says Cap'n Cuttlefish's name. However, this little article is canonically written by yet another fictional character. And in the world of Splatoon, Cap'n isn't a celebrity. He's an eccentric war veteran. So of course, he'd simply be a mysterious old man to this random music commentator. The piece of evidence that finally convinced me that indeed, while not explicitly stated, this old man is meant to be Cap'n Cuttlefish is this tweet introducing his character all the way back in 2015 that uses the exact same Japanese idiom. Ink or sink? So I know I've spent a long time talking about how the music of Splatoon is in a fictional, untranslatable language, but sneaky little Nintendo over here has added in at least two real English words into one of the songs by Wet Floor. While it's only music by the idols that get their full pages for the lyrics, the Splatoon 2 album booklet has a full fictional interview with the members of Wet Floor, and it brings up lyrics from Incoming that clearly read as ink o sink. I mean, literally, you can see the letter K, written to make it perfectly clear that they're not singing Inku or something that just sounds similar, they are saying the actual English words ink and sink. And I have to believe this is an homage to the song Ink or Sink made by the predecessor Squid Squad. What Floor Shibuya? Back in 2017, as a collaboration with Tower Records, an EP called Inkoming was released in Japan. It contains, of course, the songs Incoming, Rip Entry, and Dolphin Surge, and then a special cover of Incoming performed by Wet Floor Shibuya. They even performed live at the Tower Records in Shibuya, Tokyo, tickets given to those who purchased the album at launch. Again, huge thank you to Splash Road for the translations and clearing up some of the questions I had. So this is not an actual established band, but different musicians hired for this EP. That's how they got the name, Wet Floor Shibuya. They were literally just put together to perform as Wet Floor in Shibuya City. Octolings have a different accent. Remember how I said that Japanese has two syllabaries, hiragana and katakana, and how this would come back later? As a reminder, katakana is used to transcribe foreign words, and when you read the official lyrics to Off the Hook music, Pearl's lines are written in hiragana, while Marina's are written in katakana. And this isn't just to distinguish them arbitrarily, as the Squid Sisters' lines are both written in hiragana for their lyrics. This implies that Marina sings like a foreigner, with an accent. I mean, just look at how the amiibo octolings talk. English, or whatever, is a foreign language to them. Which makes sense, octolings only having recently immigrated to the surface. Anyway, this entry is only so deep on the iceberg for a non-Japanese speaking audience, because the in-game dialogue for DJ Octavio and the octoling amiibos are in katakana too. Also, despite Marina's lyrics, her in-game dialogue also has hiragana. I guess her accent got better over time. The artist Splatoon 2 does say that she is completely bilingual, mastering the inkling language by herself. I'm assuming Pearl was a big help though, as Marina says she taught her everything she knows. Skipper Pavilion Easter Egg If you recon in Skipper Pavilion, you can hear the chorus of Calamari County playing in the distance. The stage itself is under restoration, with scaffolds, fences, and drop sheets. And this makes me wonder, is this the location of the youth folk singing contest? Is it being restored because Pearl destroyed it with her voice when she was a kid? Wii U theme and Octo expansion. Okay, so this one isn't confirmed, but I still thought it was cool enough to mention. Shout out to Pyster from my Discord for pointing this out. When Agent 8 steps out into the light and sees Inkopolis for the first time, the music that plays is noticeably similar to the Wii U startup theme. This is possibly a reference to how Splatoon 1 was exclusively for the Wii U. Cuttlefish Idols 
Hikata Walker gives us a glimpse into idol culture beyond Squid Sisters, Off the Hook, and Deep Cut, a mysterious pair of cuttlefish. We find our elusive idols on page 209, which discusses the CDs of several different bands and songs organized by genre. All of the information we have on these two is right here, which translates to a miraculous duet created by two voices. This is the biggest hit of the Cuttlefish Idols, who had a string of hits that sold millions of copies. This duet of piercing high tones and gentle whispers with a mysterious floating sensation was an unparalleled tune that fascinated the teenage squids of the time. Both of them are still involved in music, such as writing songs and other musical activities. This CD is signed by the girls, making it extremely rare. We don't know exactly how long ago this duo was prominent, but we've got some clues. From the Squid Squad section of the Splatoon album, Splatoon 1 canonically takes place in 2014 ME, so basically the devs just set the Splatoon world in an equivalent to current times for convenience. Back to Hikara Walker, the next section right after the Cuttlefish Idols describes a folk rock band from 20 years prior to the events of Octo Expansion, which takes place two years after Splatoon 1. And on top of all of that, these idols are presented in a section of the book dedicated to various items found throughout the Octo Expansion, all very clearly pre-Y2K tech. And so, we can assume that this duo was most active in a mollusk era version of the 90s. As for their name, it is commonly accepted as Koi Cows, originating from this tweet. The book just calls the girls Koi Kaidoru, Cuttlefish Idols, but Rasikas and the Friends have been compiling the text from the games that is noticeably similar to actual readable words, and have reverse engineered a variety of ciphers for the many scripts. I do want to add the disclaimer, however, that this technically still falls under speculation, albeit very interesting and well researched. What we do have definitively confirmed, though, is that Cuttlings exist! No, Captain Cuttlefish doesn't count because that's just his English name. Also, a lot of people think that the Squid Sisters are Cuttlefish, but that's not canon. It's just a popular theory from Loxton and Noggin. But honestly, I think that thanks to these two, that theory is even more believable since we know Cuttlefish humanoids are canon to Splatoon. All I wonder now is, will we ever see these two again? The book says they're still involved in music, but only time will tell. And that's all for now. Obviously, we've just got Splatoon 3 and Deep Cut, so now there is an entirely new OST with future lore and fun facts to find. And we can finally get some answers. Like, who is the clam in front row? How did Off the Hook meet Damp Socks? Will Harmony's fish die? And of course, what is the full story behind Deep Cut? We can save all of that for the next iceberg, because no doubt in a few years I will make a second video covering all the new things we'll learn from Splatoon 3. If I missed anything else from the first two games that you think would fit in the next iceberg, let me know in the comments. But as you've noticed, I am a stickler for sources and citations, so the more specific the better. And until next time, till our fates align, let your colors shine.